how to begin bird photography. In this video, I'm going to tell you five tips to kickstart your bird photography so that you learn how I take photos like these. If you struggle to find birds, to get closer to them without spooking them or nail more consistent sharp photos with better background, this video is for you. By the way, I'm Tim Manley. I'm a full-time bird and wildlife photographer, and I'm the judge for the Bird Photographer of the Year contest for the past two years. I wish I knew these when I first began 10 years ago without all the trial and errors. So make sure to stay until the end because tip number eight is really powerful. Tip number one. When I first started bird photography, I felt hopeless very quickly. I had an entry-level Canon Rebel and I spent a fortune to get the first generation 100 to 400 mm lens. I thought I would never need another lens. I bought some bird photography books and I also browsed the internet. I saw some mind-blowing photos such as gray gray owl and snowy owl flying down with talons out on the snow or those colorful kingfisher with birds in the mouth, water splashing or golden eagle diving down for red fox. It's so stunning, so beautiful that I look at these photos every day, worshipping. I wonder how many years these photographers must have taken to wait for that special moment. These photos are so good that made me hesitate to even go out to take pictures because I know I can never reach such high level. It would take me more than a year to realize that many of these photos were fake. Fake in a way that the photographers cheated. They have either baited the birds, meaning they put live or dead bait like a mouse to lure the birds in or play bird calls to attract them or put fish in glass bucket filled with water to get those birds to dive down and have the water splash. They use those methods to manipulate the birds and change their behavior to just get a photo. I hate that. There's nothing worse than tricking the birds just for a photo. So tip number one is to be aware of that many photos you see are fake. So don't feel bad as a beginner and don't do any of those baiting crap. Beginning photographers may want to take shortcuts and go to the dark side. So. Be very careful. Tip number two, finding birds that are not skittish. One time I found a place called San Jacinto Wildlife Refuge near Los Angeles. I was happy because I thought if it's called a wildlife refuge, it's got to have a lot of birds. I drove there and I did see a lot of birds such as hawks along the road perched on top of telephone poles. The problem is, the bird took off when I was still half a mile away, so no photos. Later, I learned that it was the hunting season, so the birds are super skittish. So finding birds that are not skittish is very important for bird photography. One idea is to check before you go to make sure that it's not hunting season. Later, I heard from eBirds that an osprey was showing up regularly in Sepulveda Basin Wildlife Refuge. Oops, Wildlife Refuge again. I drove there after work, three hours in LA traffic. The osprey was on the telephone pole, but this time he's not flying away, at least. But be careful what you wish for. This time I wanted to get an in-flight photo and I waited for four hours. The moment I look at my phone to check what time it was, he flew away. It would take me years to learn of places such as Lake Blue Cypress in Florida that has hundreds of nesting ospreys each April and May. I went there one time and in one morning, I took more close-up osprey in flight photos than five years combined when I was in Los Angeles. So this dawned on me. Sighting is not the same as good photos. I used to rely on eBirds. But eBirds is not really suitable for photographers. I wrote a blog some years ago called Bird Photographers are from Mars, Bird Watchers are from Venus. For bird watchers, the further, the better. The less action, the better. They don't care about the background, the perch, or the light. So my tip is to only go when birds are in their breeding plumage that looks the best and go where they have a large number together aggregating. For example, Bosque del Apache in New Mexico for winter is a good place to start. So the key is to spend much, much more time on research. Go to Facebook groups, Fred Miranda Nature Forums, even to Wildlife Refuge, but make friends with people and make sure not to disturb other photographers when they are photographing. When you find a good place, go back again and again and it makes a huge difference. Tip number three, Michelin stars for background. 
Long ear owl is one species that I dream to photograph. One year, a friend of mine heard about a long ear owl sighting in Los Angeles, and we spent 12 hours looking but failed. Later, I went back again and I saw the owl in deep leaves, high up, no photos. Then, due to some family emergency last year, I went home for two months to Hong Kong, and there was a sighting of a long ear owl in California, which was not skittish. The owl was hunting for rodents every day in the clear. I saw numerous top-notch photos of the owl perched or in flight with spectacular clean background. A good location one evening can get more photos than a bad location for 10 years combined. So if you heard of a place with spectacular background and the bird is not skittish, just go. Short year owls. One year I went to photograph short year owls in the Seattle area for three days. I still haven't finished posting the good ones and it's been over six years since I went there. Long ear owl with clean background versus searching 12 hours from e-birds is a huge difference. My belief is good sighting of one evening can last you a year of good photo sharing. There's a place in Alaska, for example, where you can get tufted puffins in flight shooting from a cliff and you can get photos where the background is dark and then you can get the top side of uh, the bird, which usually evoke more emotion. Tip number four. Cameras does matter. If the camera is designed more for a still subject, there can be a lag on autofocus. The key is to get a high frame rate camera, minimum eight frames per second. I remember switching to an eight frames per second Canon 7D, which makes a huge difference over my 5D Mark II, which was four frames per second. Even though the image quality was a lot better on the 5D Mark II, but the 7D nailed the shots more consistently. The 1D series was a big step up because they can drive the autofocus of the lens even faster. If budget is a concern, I will look into a used Canon R6 because the R6 Mark II has just came out and the R6 is a pretty good deal. Tip number five. I was hesitant to buy Super Telephoto Prime Lens because they cost more than a used car or a new car. I was using the version 1 Canon 100-400 for many years. Then one year I switched to an old 405.6 Prime Lens. It's an old design, but the image quality was much better and autofocus was way better. So these days, the Canon 100-500 or the Sony 200-600 Image quality is great, and the autofocus in bright light condition is fast. But with a large F number on those zoom lens, it's harder to get a clean background. So I would try to rent a prime or buy a used prime lens if you can. Tip number six. When a bird flies, I used to use AV mode and track them and blast a few shots. Results is that some pics are bright, some are too dark. I would suggest using manual mode for birds. And for birds, I would use spot metering. Not spotting on the bird, be careful, but put the spot on some mid-tone area in front of you, such as tree trunks, rocks, tall grass, that has the same light shining on them as the bird that is gonna show up. Then adjust, for example, 2,000 of a second for flight. And if it is bright, I will set aperture at f5.6, 6.3, or 7.1. If low light, then I do wide open aperture. And make sure that the ISO is set to plus 0.7. And that's for front lit photos. If it's back lit, I will have other videos to talk about it. Tip number seven. Back then, when I see a bird, I just stand there and I take as many photos as possible. But photography is about the light. How one perceives your photo is about how you use the light. And these days, I always make sure I know where the sun is so I can align my subject with the angle of the sun to avoid harsh shadow. And that really changes my photography. And if you want to win some photo contests, think in the perspective of the judge. 90% of the photos submitted are front-lit. So a backlit shot will stand out more. Give it a try. Before I get to tip number eight, this video is brought to you by me. My digital workflow called Dynamic Tension Stacking has gotten over 500 students. So check it out in the link below. Tip number eight. For birds on ground or in water, always get as low as possible and it instantly will look more professional. 
To summarize, bear photography isn't as difficult as you think, but a lot of work needs to put in the preparation instead of just relying on the luck of seeing a bird when you are driving or hiking because that won't lead to good photos. If you like these photos, then you don't want to miss this one. About five ways to instantly take amazing bird and wildlife photos. Remember to like and subscribe and comment below if you have any questions or suggestions and I'll see you next time.